super exciting day today because I have Flounder out. I think this is my first time, no, second time handling him. He's just staying still. He's not moving. I lured him out with a nice juicy hornworm and he came out for it and he squirted me in the face with it. So he's just chilling now. He had his worm and he's just figuring things out. He's like, okay, this seems safe, but we're making progress with flounder. So here he is. He is looking beautiful. I think he's actually brighter on this side right now. Yeah, look at those colors. He's amazing. So I'm not going to keep him out for this entire video, but I wanted to show you guys him because he looks wonderful and I'm holding him. So I'm just super excited that I'm getting to handle him, but we're going to go ahead and put him back. So say goodbye to Flounder. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm so excited that I actually got to hold Flounder. I need to work on that a little bit more. Lately, I'm working on Flounder and I'm starting to work with Abraxas on handling, which I kind of, I don't know, the past year, I'm like, I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I'm really putting an effort in and I think it may happen, but it's going to take a long time. He's probably going to be the most challenging one just because he's so fast and skittish. But yeah, I'll, maybe I'll make a video on that. Let me know. Are you guys interested in seeing how I try to build a trusting handling relationship with Abraxas, my jeweled Lacerda? I don't know. Let me know if you're interested in that. But in today's video, I wanted to make a video going over basically things that I see when it comes to taking care of reptiles that people do wrong. And not because it's something, like it's an easy mistake to make based on not having maybe that much experience or knowledge about reptile care. Um, people a lot of the times make these mistakes while starting out and sometimes it happens later on like they may just be doing this over time and not realize that it's a mistake um, and it's some of them are like not like basic huge mistakes it's just things that I notice here and there that can be problematic so I wanted to bring some attention to these things just because I notice them quite frequently so let me know in the comments if you can come up with any others that you guys notice because I just want to bring awareness to all of these things and just improve overall care when it comes to keeping our reptiles. So the very first one is when people think that they need to keep their entire enclosure wet because the animal has a high humidity requirement. So when an animal does have a high humidity requirement, it means that there needs to be a higher amount of water vapor in the air. So people think that the easiest way to achieve this is by obviously having a more moist and wet enclosure, which can be helpful, but some people tend to overdo it. And if you overdo it, it can actually be very unhealthy for your animal. So there needs to be like a healthy balance between like humidity and ventilation in the enclosure and how to achieve that proper humidity. So it's very common for people that have an animal with a humidity requirement that's high to have a moist substrate, which is great. You do want a moist substrate. However, you don't want it to be sopping wet 24 seven. That is not healthy. So typically what I recommend when you have animals with a high humidity requirement is that you want there to be variances during the day, just like it would be in nature. So what I typically do is I will mist the enclosure every morning, let it dry out during the day. You want there to be a dry period. Typically during the day, things will dry out quicker because you have lighting and things like that that'll be absorbing all of that moisture. Um, and then at nighttime, I will mist again. And typically it'll stay a little bit more moist at nighttime with all of those lights off. So you want there to be dry periods even if the animal has a high humidity requirement. Some people just think automatically it needs to be sopping wet 24 seven. You don't want that because that can actually lead to respiratory infections and a lot of bacteria growth in the enclosure and you absolutely don't want that. So everything needs to be balanced and done in a healthy manner when it comes to having a high humidity. Number two is that people think that when you go bioactive, you never have to refresh the substrate ever again. So this is not accurate either. So basically, yes, if you have a healthy and well-established bioactive enclosure with microfauna in it, 
the microfauna are going to eat away at the waste in the enclosure which is great. It will keep the environment cleaner. So some people think that if it's so established and it's gonna take care of all the waste, I don't have to do anything and I'm never gonna have to replace substrate. And that's not true. Um, with any animal, you want to be spot cleaning. Yes, microfauna are great at eating away waste, but especially if you have a larger reptile, if they poop and it's a big poop, they're not gonna eat all of that. So that needs to still be cleaned up by you by doing hand cleaning whenever you see poop in the enclosure. Um, and secondly, because of that, it's not always possible for the microfauna to get all of the waste in the enclosure. And some people may not have like as established of a microfauna situation as is needed to keep an enclosure perfectly clean. It's just not realistic. It's helpful and it can be beneficial, but it cannot be relied upon 100% that the microfauna are going to take care of all of the waste in the enclosure. So if your bioactive enclosure is doing well, your spot cleaning, everything is looking fresh and good. It could be good for a while without having to change out the substrate, but after a prolonged time period, it's good to just refresh here and there. Maybe take a lot of it out that's old and put in some fresh and put in some new microfauna. Um, it's not a situation where like the entire lifespan of your reptile will just have one thing of substrate and microfauna for the rest of its life. You need to pay attention to it, see how it's looking and smelling with spot cleaning and just check on things and it's good to refresh here and there if you feel that it's necessary. Number three is that big enclosures are stressful. It is so common in the reptile keeping community, especially when it comes to keeping snakes like ball pythons, people will always recommend to have smaller enclosures. They do this for crested geckos as well, especially when you get a baby as, as they're growing up because if they have a larger enclosure, people think that they'll be stressed out and they won't eat which has happened when people upgrade their animals into larger enclosures. However, a lot of the time when this happens, it's because they're being placed in a new enclosure that has a lot more space and that space is not filled out. So basically the reptile is just going in this big, empty, open space and they're trapped inside of it and they can see you watching it. And that's not, not gonna be a chill situation for them. They are not gonna like that. They're going to be very stressed out. So that's why if you are going to be upgrading, the important thing to do is just make sure that you fill out the enclosure as much as possible and offer a lot of different hiding opportunities for your reptile to reduce stress and feel safe in that new larger environment. Over time, once they accumulate and they feel safe in that setup, they're going to utilize most of it, if not all of it. These reptiles, a lot of people think, are not going to be using the space. They notice once they upgrade them, they do end up utilizing it. So it is really important to make sure that you are just filling out the enclosure. I always recommend to go as large as you possibly can when keeping any type of reptile because it will be beneficial for them. There's so much more opportunity for enrichment and just for a more happy, fulfilled life when you're in captivity because they can do things, they can think, they can smell new things. Like you don't want them to be bored and trapped in a tiny little setup. That's not fair to them. So, and they will not be super stressed out with a larger enclosure. They will appreciate it if it's done correctly and you just fill it out and give them a lot of hiding places. Number four is people that use a temp gauge instead of a temp gun. I notice this all the time, especially when I'm working uh, people get really confused where to put their temp gauge in their enclosure. And I don't recommend using them at all. A lot of the times it seems like they aren't even that accurate. And other times it's just unfortunate because you put it in one spot of the enclosure and it's only measuring that spot. And I think it's really good to be able to measure throughout the entire enclosure, make sure that all of the different temp ranges are safe and adequate for your reptile because not only do they need a warm basking area, they also need a cool area. Everything needs to be measured and made sure that it is in the right range. So in order to do this, a temp gauge that's gonna be sticking to the wall in one location in the enclosure is just not gonna cut it. Um, what I recommend is to use a temp gun 
You can get them for like 20 bucks on Amazon and they work so well and you only need that one thing and then you can measure all of the enclosures wherever you want throughout any spot of your enclosure with that gun. And they're also very accurate. So yes, just don't use the temp gauges, just toss them. I don't think that they are worth your money at all. Just get a temp gun, it'll be 20 bucks and it's going to last you as long as you need and you can measure literally any temperature anywhere that you want anytime. It's just way more efficient, going to be worth your buck. It'll just help you keep better track of the temperature ranges for all of your animals. Number five is using water bowls for arboreal reptiles. So people yell at me for this all of the time in my videos, especially for people that have like crested geckos or even chameleons or even, um, arboreal snakes as well. Um, I typically recommend when you're hydrating a lot of these animals that the hydration is going to be through misting the enclosure and then they lick the moisture off of the leaves and such in order to hydrate themselves. And I say that they do not drink from water bowls. And then someone will come in the comments and be like, mine does, so you're wrong. The thing is, most arboreal reptiles will not naturally go to the bottom of the enclosure to a stagnant bowl of water and drink from it. They are not like dogs or cats where they see a water source that's still and can drink from it. A lot of arboreals, they are very much focused on movement. So not only movement when they're hunting, but movement with water as well with those water driplets. So. That's why I recommend to not use the water bowls. However, you can use them. You can use them to increase humidity of the overall enclosure. Yes, if your animal will choose to drink from it, that's fantastic. I just don't recommend fully relying on that because that is not going to be adequate for most arboreal reptiles. A lot of them will need either a misting system or you misting the enclosure or a drip system in order to properly stay hydrated. And then of course, they're gonna be getting a lot of moisture from the food that they're eating as well. And the last one is heat lights at nighttime. So a lot of people, I think, especially when they're starting out keeping reptiles, it seems like they forget about checking the temperature requirements for the reptile at nighttime. They focus on the daytime and they see, for instance, like I see this all the time with bearded dragon owners that are new, they think, okay, my bearded dragon comes from the desert and it needs a really hot temperature. That's all they look at is like the daytime temperature requirement. And then they assume that the beardy is also going to need that hot temperature at nighttime. So I see bearded dragon owners all the time with lights on at nighttime. And what's also really, really bad about this is that they typically will go for the red light bulbs or like the blue or purple, whatever weird color bulbs they have. And those can irritate your lizard's eyes or snake's eyes. They're just not beneficial, especially the red light bulbs. Like they are notorious for causing eye damage. And what just kicks me so much is that none of them are needed at all. And if you look at the temperature requirement for your reptile at nighttime, it is most likely going to require a significant drop in temperature at nighttime because that's naturally how it is in the wild as well. It's always gonna be cooler at nighttime. And then when the sun is out during the day, it's going to be warm. So most of the time, those heat sources are completely unnecessary at nighttime. And especially if it's a light, it can cause your animal to lose its day night cycle because it's not gonna be dark at nighttime anymore and that can also mess with them and throw off like their eating schedule and they may not be feeling well from it, they may not be properly digesting, like it's a whole thing. So typically, again, you want that temp gun. You want the temp gun. The temp gun will allow you to see what temperature it is at nighttime and during the day and you want there to always be a drop no matter what type of species you're keeping. The one thing that is great that I still think is perfectly fine is if you leave your heat pads on, especially for snakes at nighttime, that's totally fine. Because the thing is they have a warm hide and they have a cool hide at all times, which is they have the option. So at nighttime, if they typically, most 
snakes are nocturnal anyway, they're going to be most active at nighttime, so they're going to be roaming around at nighttime. But if they want to go back and retreat to a warmer hide, they can. And if they think that's too warm for them at the time and they want to go to a cool hide, they have that option. If you are like blasting a heat light on your reptile at nighttime though, they lose that option and it may actually be causing harm to your reptile because it's just unnatural and not something that they actually need. I do notice that um, in the winter, there it can be really, really cold, especially at nighttime. So you, some people may notice that it is getting a little bit too cold at nighttime. So they do need a little bit more of a heat source. And for this, you can use a low wattage ceramic heat emitter if needed, or what I use for my reptile room just to significantly bump the entire um, ambient temperature of the entire room and all the enclosures is a space heater. Um, of course, make sure everything is regulated and safe. We don't want any fire hazards. And if you are using a ceramic heat emitter, just make sure to use that temp gun and make sure that it is still in a safe range. You don't want to be overheating your reptile at nighttime. So it's just so important to always be looking at the daytime requirements and the nighttime temperature requirements as well for any reptile that you keep. So these are just things that I notice that are just very easy mistakes to make. And sometimes people just don't think about these things and don't realize it. So I figured it would be a good idea to make a video on it. But if you guys can think of any other things that you guys notice people making common mistakes on like this, please go ahead and leave it in the comment section. I hope that today's video was helpful and I will see you guys in the next one.